Good morning, and welcome to Bethany Chapel Worship. Whether you're joining us here in the room or watching later online, we welcome you and we'll be blessed to share together Brian Hanger's senior sermon as he looks forward to the completion of his MA this May. In this second chapel of the semester, it may be a gray and rainy February for us, at least in the room, but let us nonetheless rise and sing with cheer, the light of the Spirit is among us. Let us sing here in this place, number six in our hymn. Would you remain standing as we join in the call to worship? Here we are, young and less young, strong and less strong, gathering in anticipation of the kingdom message. Illumine us with your fire and love, Holy Spirit, so that the new life of God's reign will shine here and now. This is a radical prayer. Do we know what we ask? We know that God's reign is good news. It is indeed, and yet this reign is inaugurated upon a cross. We do not deny the pains of labor, but look with joy for the burden of justice and peace. As we remain standing, let us sing together number 369, Lord Who's Love.
reading from Luke. Then he said to them all, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What does it mean for someone to take up their cross daily and follow Christ? It's something we've all heard many, many times. And we've probably all said it before, too. Some of us may have even preached it. But do we really understand what it means to take up the cross in our daily lives in the world we live in? In the exchange that happens in Luke's ninth chapter, we see Jesus connecting the idea of taking up one's cross with the suffering that he will endure on Calvary. He explicitly says, the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Jesus' death on the cross has been the topic of theologizing and speculation since the moment he was nailed to the tree. But a common interpretation that stems from Jesus' death and his command for his followers to take up their cross is that the Christian life is a life of suffering for Christ's sake. We are supposedly fools for Christ, willing and ready to take the brunt of punishment on both cheeks. We are to eagerly hoist the cross upon ourselves and endure what Jesus endured, because that's what he commanded us to do. This kind of interpretation is common among Anabaptist groups like us brethren who favor a plain reading of scripture. But I've been thinking about this idea all throughout my time here in seminary. And as our friend and colleague Nancy Bowen is known to say, it's, it's complicated. I came to Bethany with an intense interest about Brethren history, theology, and peace witness, but also about the traditions of liberation theology that started to challenge my thinking when I was in Brethren volunteer service. Coming to seminary and reading writers like James Cohn, Yvonne Gibara, and Drew Hart led me to think more critically about how scripture has been interpreted and applied in my faith communities that I've been predominantly white and middle class. I've learned more and more at Bethany about how much context, history, sociology, economics, and politics affect not only how the stories of the Bible were crafted, but how they've been interpreted, passed down, and laden with meaning. And I've also learned that sometimes these meanings and interpretations have to be interrogated in order to, for us to figure out how we're to live scripture out today. With respect to taking up the cross, we need to examine a few things. Most importantly, Christ gives this command to his disciples who are about to go out and do amazing things in the name of Jesus. They're going to heal and preach and demonstrate that the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus is going to proclaim, I see Satan fall like lightning because the evil one and the principalities and powers are starting to be defeated by the power of God working in the disciples. This is all very exciting. But Jesus is telling them that they are going to face resistance when they announce that God's jubilee is at hand. The good news will be received as bad news by many. Thus, when Jesus is telling them to take up the cross daily, it is intimately connected to the resistance they will face when they announce that the kingdom of God is at hand. And this caution presumably comes down to us as people who have chosen to be baptized and enter into the community of believers but we need to take stock of Jesus' audience for these two scriptures. This message of taking up the cross is not the message that he preaches to the gathered community at the synagogue or to the masses when he gives his sermon on the plain. There his message is only about the inbreaking of God's kingdom 
and how this inbreaking will entail a rejection and a defeat of the oppressive forces that squelch the lives out of the poor. He doesn't talk in these settings about taking up the cross. He, cr he doesn't say that the poor will suffer because of him, nor does he demand the poor to improve their own lot by taking up the cross. No, instead he plainly proclaims the year of Jubilee and announces that the oppressed will go free and the poor will be liberated and blessed. I was thinking about this connection and paradox between these two scriptures as I was riding down the Magdalena River in Colombia while on my cross-cultural trip with Christian peacemaker teams last month. We were returning from our trip to the small village of Guayabo and our whirlwind trip had taught us a lot. Guayabo is made up mostly of campesino peasant farmers who've inhabited this land for the last 30 years since the previous owner lost the land due to money problems and a massive flood. According to the UNHCR, Colombia currently has an estimated 6.9 million internally displaced persons. That's on par with Syria. Many of Guayabo's residents came to this land because they were internally displaced by violence and drug trafficking, so much else. But if you didn't know that history and context, you'd think these people had been living for generations in this land, given the deep connection they had. They dutifully raise plantains, cacao plants, corn, and so much more. The farming they do sustains the life of their people, and it's truly a beautiful thing to behold. This deep and beautiful connection, however, is under threat. You see, the son of the man who used to own the land has come back to town backed by paramilitary forces. He claims these campesino farmers have usurped the land that is rightfully his. He claims a victim status and is trying to evict this disempowered community off their land. The community has become organized as a result and they're trying to resist this injustice in the courts in any other way possible. But this son, whose name is Rodrigo, has successfully and illegally evicted one of the community members from their home and land already. This eviction is just one small manifestation of the larger web of injustices that continue to dictate life for the poor in Colombia. Other issues involve the intense patriarchy, racism, homophobia, and poverty that saturates Colombian life. One group that we met with who is combating this on a grassroots level is a group known as the Organización Femenina Popular. They go by OFP for short. The OFP is amazing. They started organizing in the early 70s as a nonviolent movement of women organized to build up the status of women, teach women their human and political rights, and put a stop to societal plagues such as domestic violence, food insecurity, and war. The movement began in local churches when, when at the time they were knee deep in liberation theology and praxis. But like so many other church movements, the spirit of liberation evaporated from the church and the people were left to find empowerment on their own. This was evident when we went to visit OFP branches scattered throughout the region. Each branch had attempted to encapsulate the spirit of their work and identity in beautiful murals that decorate the walls of their meeting places. And while each of the murals were unique, common threads were, 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 were very, oh, excuse me, <coughs> common threads started to emerge. Freedom, hope, rebirth and resurrection, the land, and transformation were all over the place. And these themes found their expression in symbols of raised tree trunks sprouting new life, a phoenix's fiery rebirth, and women with arms outstretched taking flight into a better future. It was interesting to note, however, that for an organization that began in the Catholic Church and that remains constituted of committed Christians, the symbols that undergird and empower the OFP's hope and resistance have no connection to Christian symbols. The Christian cross covers similar thematic areas of resurrection and freedom, but other symbols are used instead. Part of this may come from the fact that new symbols and new interpretations are needed for a new era, but part of the reason may stem from women's experience of the church in Colombian society. In Colombia, Simply being a woman is often understood as a burdensome cross to bear. So instead of trying to redeem the cross as the ultimate symbol of liberation, perhaps the women of the OFP needed to find symbols that more genuinely reflected the feminine spirit 
that undergirded their resistance and hope for the future. And I think this experience of the OFP is instructive for how Christians committed to the Jubilee of Jesus have to start thinking about crosses in our society. Before the cross became a symbol of redemption, it was an instrument of death and oppression. And that's the way it is still experienced by many across the world. That goes for Colombian women and Campesino farmers, and it goes for black women and immigrant children here in America. Our society's voraciousness towards prosperity has meant that crosses of poverty, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia have all been heaped upon the disempowered and the disinherited. Like Cyrene, they never had the agency or the opportunity to consider whether or not they wanted a cross because we as a church and society have dropped crosses on them already. Listen to how Brazilian nun Yvonne Guevara thinks of the cross. Quote, the cross is always a scandal, unhappiness, sickness, desertion, objective and subjective suffering, and we fight against it. We fight it through the presence of others with the help of those who say no to the cross. The no to the cross is a yes to salvation and justice and happiness. Or how womanist theologian Kelly Brown Douglas thinks of the cross. The cross reflects the lengths that unscrupulous power will go to sustain itself. It is power's last stand. It is the pinnacle of the human opposition to God. But despite these sobering words, these thinkers and writers do not suggest that we rid the Christian imagination of the symbol of the cross. Rather, the cross has to be put into the context of Jesus' announcement of Jubilee and the struggles of those already under the burden of society's crosses. As James Cone reminds us in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, the cross places God in the midst of crucified people, in the midst of people who are hung, shot, burned, and tortured. This means that God accompanies and stands in solidarity with those on the margins and those whom our lives of consumption, greed, and indifference have oppressed. And Jesus doesn't hide this fact. He announced this right after he gave his first sermon that day in Nazareth. After all spoke well of him, Jesus jumped into a diatribe about how prophets are never accepted in their hometown. And in so doing, aligns himself with Elijah, who instead of coming to heal God's elect in Israel, went to the world's disinherited in Sidon to demonstrate God's power and love. Scholar Joel Green in his commentary on Luke notes how the writer of Luke extends this parallel in the seventh chapter, where Jesus goes to Nain, greets a widow who has lost her only son, feels tremendous grief and compassion for her, and brings her son back to life. Christ, in traveling about, meets people in the midst of everyday struggles, enters into their reality in order to be in solidarity with them, and brings new life out of crucifying realities. Things are not always as dramatic as a man coming back to life, but a thread runs throughout Jesus' ministry that testifies to a God committed to resisting the crosses put on the marginalized. In John, Jesus stands with the woman caught in adultery to stop the men from stoning her. In Matthew, we see the Canaanite woman assert her personhood and dignity directly to Jesus, and we see Jesus embrace her and her resilient spirit. In all of the synoptic gospels, we see the bleeding woman desperately come to Jesus, seeking healing in a way that flew in the face of the norms and purity laws of the day. And we see Jesus commend her faith, heal, and bless her. And in Luke, we see the persistent woman pestering the unjust judge until a fair verdict is finally rendered. These examples of resistance and resilience go on and on, and they all show the character of a God who desires a kingdom where nobody has to have a cross unjustly thrust upon them. And in order to do that, he's willing to have a cross thrust upon him. This is the paradoxical and beautiful connection between taking up one's cross daily and the ushering in of God's kingdom. And specifically, it is the key move that we, as privileged Christians, have to make in order to truly participate in Jesus' jubilee. We who have the choice to pick up a cross or not must do the counterintuitive and just thing and pick up a cross. Or better yet, 
get out of our bubbles to be with our suffering brothers and sisters and help them shoulder their cross until we can throw off that heavy yoke together. This is the kind of solidarity and accompanying work that I experience with Christian peacemaker teams in Colombia. And I think it offers a model for how those of us interested in peace and justice should begin living in to God's Jubilee. When Christian peacemaker teams, they go by CPT for short, first started in Colombia, it was just a bunch of white North Americans who were willing to be in a conflict zone and who were eager to get in the way when things went awry. What CPT found after several years of being there, however, was that their willingness to get in the way was a huge part of the problem. Although their presence was often helpful in the short run since they took the lead centering their role as protectors of these communities, in the long run this was leaving these communities hamstrung. CPT was quelling the immediate violence, getting a good story and good promo for their donors, but the communities they were supposedly helping became little more than docile towns treating the white CPTers as saviors. This wasn't building up the community, and it wasn't engaging the latent cultures of resistance and hope that have now been flourishing since CPT changed their strategies. Now, CPT's accompaniment work is much subtler and is built upon forging strong relationships with community members and leaders. In Guayabo alone, there were four community leaders that have organized everybody in the town around this land process. The people of Guayabo are educated about what's going on, and they're each taking action in ways they can. CPT still comes around, but they are now collaborators whose resources and skills can complement the communities. Their accompaniment has decentered the role of CPT's physical presence so that they can both provide pastoral support and leadership and also provide an avenue to get the stories of these communities out to the larger public. The way that CPT describes their work is, CPT's story is the story of these communities. And I think this kind of kinship and solidarity that CPT exemplifies is the same that Jesus had in mind when he came to earth. He saw the ways in which we had been caught up in the web of violence, injustice, and poverty. He saw all these crosses that we had put upon one another. And as a result, Jesus came to earth for the ultimate mission of accompaniment. As when God heard the groans of the Israelites and remembered his covenant with his people, so Jesus came to earth to show every person under the sun what God desires for the human community. God could not leave us to our own devices, but rather had to become like us. God had to directly make humanity's story God's story through the incarnation. And in so doing, Jesus invited us to be a part of his story. Jesus invites us to live into God's jubilee, and we can only do this by taking up our cross and helping our sister bear and resist her cross. We resist these crosses put upon others, knowing that we might find ourselves on the cross instead or together along with them. We do this not out of vain glory or some romantic vision of martyrdom, but because it is what Jesus did and it is what agape love demands. We have to realize that God does not desire suffering for suffering's sake. Suffering comes from people's response to faithful witnessing to the truth. We resist these crosses in Jesus' name, testifying to what Jubilee entails. And we must praise God for such a liberating message, and we must put it into practice. We must change the structures of a society and church that routinely crucify. We have to uproot the values and ethics that have taken root in us, that allow us to be complacent in the face of great suffering. We have to wake up to what God is doing and what God's announcing with Jubilee. We have to join Jesus in his liberating mission to the world. As theologian Jose Antonio Pagola has written, Jesus commits all his energy to eliminating suffering from the world. His whole life was a struggle to free human beings from the suffering that comes from sickness, hunger, injustice, abuse, sin, or death. Those who would follow him cannot ignore the people who suffer. On the contrary, our first task is to remove suffering from human life. More than anything else, taking up the cross 
means accepting the painful consequences that will surely come as a result of faithfully following Jesus. Jesus commits all his energy to eliminating suffering from the world. What a beautiful sentence. The man who was murdered on a cross spent his entire earthly existence trying to lift people out of crucifying realities and preach into existence a society that would no longer crucify its brothers and sisters. But we must remember the man who was murdered on the cross was also raised from the dead. We can never forget that. The resurrection does many wonderful things for us as Christians, but chief among them is the way that it vindicates the character and witness of Jesus' earthly existence. Because that's what those healings, teachings, and actions were. Foretastes of resurrection, a whiff of jubilee, a glimpse of what the kingdom of God will be like. But that day has not yet come, has it, y'all? Crosses are still in our midst, and they come in many forms. Gun violence runs rampant in our country. Human trafficking steals millions of lives worldwide. Immigration policies dehumanize our Latina neighbors. LGBTQIA plus persons are oppressed simply for their sexual orientation. Drug addiction cripples our community here in Richmond. Nigerian girls are snatched from their schools and homes. Syrian children know nothing but growing up in a war zone. Police brutality snuffs out black lives here in America. Oil pipelines are being built today on stolen land. Executive orders target Muslim communities unfairly. Economies puff up the 1% and shirk the rest of us. An ecological catastrophe looms all around the rest of that. There are many crosses of injustice to resist in this world. And there's plenty of work to go around for everybody, so don't worry. But the question remains, are there laborers ready to do this divine work? Jesus' announcement of Jubilee threatens the powers that be because the way of the world will be beautifully different when Jubilee is the law of the land. But ushering in this liberative time will not be easy. Jesus beckons us as disciples to get up out of our comfort, get up out of our privilege, and to make the story of the world suffering and oppressed the story of the church. Jesus' divinely radical empathy led him in to crucifying realities, to preach good news to the poor and the crucified classes of society. So when he asks us to take up our cross daily, it means we have to travel where Jesus did to do this difficult work of bearing and resisting crosses until the beauty of Jubilee shapes the story of the world. Are we ready to resist crosses in the name of Jesus? time during this next hymn or after worship, I invite you to participate in a small ritual as perhaps a beginning of responding to the words we've heard today. In the bowl in the worship center, you'll find small paper crosses like this that have written on them the name of some cross that children of God around the world might be bearing today. Not as an obligation of worship, but if you feel called, come forward and take one. Hold it. Pray for the concrete situations wherever someone might find themselves under that cross until such a time as you have found a way to come alongside or to take some small action to help resist that cross. Or, if you feel called, write on one of these crosses an injustice or an oppression, a, a crucifixion that you or someone near you has suffered. Feel free to add that to the bowl or to add that to the bowl and take a different one. At the end of worship or after some time, most of these crosses that remain in the bowl will be pinned up for at least a week or until someone who comes by has claimed them. And for those of you who are watching online, I believe we will have during this hymn and after some of the phrases that are found in this bowl 
on the screen for you to reflect and think, where can I come alongside and resist a cross? Remember, this is only the beginning of our response to the words we've heard. Let us sing how we can help us to help one another. I'll leave you today with the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. After all these years, his words deeply resonate and challenge. Dr. King tells us, we must make a choice. Will we continue to march to the drumbeat of conformity and respectability, or will we, listening to the beat of a more distant drum, move to its echoing sounds? Will we march only to the music of our time, or will we, risking criticism and abuse, march to the soul-saving music of eternity? Amen. Go in peace.